Hello, Fabric community. My name is Ryan Majidimer. I'm a product manager on the Fabric team, and welcome to the November 2023 Fabric Monthly Update. Got a lot of exciting updates for you this month, including updates in Core, Synapse, Data Factory, and Power BI. If you want to know more information about all those features, as well as detailed descriptions, screenshots, links to docs, all sorts of fun stuff, I highly recommend you check out our blog. Find our blog at aka.mswac, Fabric Blog. Also, if you have not checked out the Fabric community, or if you haven't been there recently, I highly recommend you check that out as well at aka.mswac, Fabric Community. Uh, there's all sorts of people asking questions, answering questions, giving people kudos. Everybody wants kudos, right? Uh, there's galleries of Power BI dashboards, all sorts of fun stuff like that, and more stuff coming each and every month. So definitely check that out. Also, of course, all these links are in the description of this video. But without further ado, let's get into it. For Core, we have Microsoft Fabric User API. Moving on to Power BI. For Reporting, we have Button Slicer. That's in preview. Reference Labels, also in preview. Enhance your Q&A visual with suggested synonyms from Copilot. In visual, it, in, in visual, in preview, on object interaction updates, also in preview. We've got a demo for this one. We're going to hand it over to Roseanne. Most requested this month, we're bringing you the ability to configure your pane switcher to stack panes instead of swap. So if you prefer the behavior from before where the panes open side by side by default, you can now configure this setting by checking the new option for always open in new pane from either the options menu or the view ribbon. Also highly requested, this month we've also added the ability to resize the data flyout, which is the second flyout, from the build button when working with long field names. We have also added the add button back to table. Originally, we had to remove the Add button from the table visual type, as the only chart element to add from this menu was the title and did not contain a default value. This was adding user confusion to the experience because simply turning on the title did not appear to change anything in the visual. Users had to go all the way to the format pane to be able to type in their visual's title. Last month, since we shipped placeholder text, we are now able to show the Add button again because turning on title will now show the placeholder. Thanks, Roseanne. Next, we have Azure Maps Visual now aggregates multiple data points at the same location. Narrative Visual with Copilot. Going to hand it over to Carly for a quick demo. Here in Power BI, let me go ahead and open up my Viz pane. I'm in edit mode. Um, let me go through. I have three pages here. <clears throat> this report is about um, hotel tourism data and was actually created also by Copilot, but today we're gonna to talk about the um, narrative visual. So I have this nice empty spot on this report. I'm gonna go ahead and click on the visual. I'm gonna put it in this empty spot. So I can either choose to go with smart narratives, which was the old version of the visual or the Copilot version. So we're gonna go ahead and select the Copilot version. Now what this is gonna do is create a textual summary um, generated by Copilot of the data that's visualized in my report. I can either start with some out of the box suggestions that we have, give an, give an executive summary, create a bulleted list of insights, or answer likely questions from leadership, or I can create a custom prompt to help summarize the data on my report. And either way, we'll generate a textual summary of these prompts. I can either do the current page, um, I can select the entire report, or I can even do um, specific combinations of visuals and pages. I can select or deselect um, what I want summarized versus not summarized. So let's go ahead and do across the entire report for now, and let's start with one of the um, out of the box suggestions that we have here. So let's provide an executive summary across my entire report and see what happens here. And while it's thinking, how this works is it doesn't actually query the underlying data set. It only pulls from the visuals that are on the report and even further what I have selected in this little drop down here. 
All right, so we have an executive summary here. We can scroll through and get a good look at what's happening. And for every kind of section or bullet point here, we have references. So this gives an idea of where each um, section of the summary is pulled from in the report. So these references, if I hover over them, say uh, what visual this little segment of data is being pulled from. And if I go ahead and click, it tells me uh, specifically what visual, so it highlights. If it comes from a different page of the report, it'll kind of zoom me over to that page. So I can read through um, and see what's going on, you know, what, what kind of data it pulled, what kind of summary, or what kind of insights it pulled. And I can use this text input to make some uh, kind of formatting changes or tone shifts. So maybe I wanna make this more professional. And this helps because I can't actually edit um, the results of the, the LLM, so I can't actually edit this text over here, but this uh, being able to kind of um, edit the prompt itself gives me some kind of control over what the output of this summary is. So this helps uh, give some element of control here. So I can make this more professional. We've also seen people do some cool things where they uh, create a table of contents for their report and do some other cool things like that. So this made it a little bit more professional here. Um, I can also do really cool things. Let's say uh, maybe I want to, again, I, I can see that this is about um, hotel tourism and I can see some of the locations here. So let's imagine that I have some stakeholders, maybe they're, uh, they're really focused um, let's see, it looks like this is from 2021 and one of the locations here, um, I think that there's some Hawaii items. So let's say I want to focus this um, summary on Maui uh, visits uh, because the stakeholders are really focused on um, improving tourism in Maui. So I can focus this summary specifically on what's been going on in uh, with tourism data in Maui and it'll create me a very focused and nuanced summary of what's uh, the, what the data looks like in Maui. And this is super helpful because uh, if this is what I want my stakeholders or my end users to focus on, I can, as an author, create this uh, really nuanced focused summary and plop this right on my report, and people don't have to sift through the visuals, they can focus on this specifically. Um, and I, I can even do some formatting shifts here where you know I can make this shorter or longer um, and direct it with custom prompts to specify what I want people to focus on even more directly. And this is kind of what, what we can do with the summary here. So I can put this into reading view. I can go ahead and save this. Um, and this is what it looks like. Thanks, Carly. On to modeling, we have data sets renamed to semantic models. Power BI semantic model support for direct lake on Synapse Data Warehouse. DAX query view to write and run DAX queries on your model. I'm going to hand it over to Zoe for a demo. We are thrilled to announce the public preview of the DAX Query View, a fourth view in Power BI Desktop that can run DAX queries. Not only does it run DAX queries, but it also generates a number of DAX queries with quick queries. On a table, you can go ahead and preview data or preview the columns with column statistics, which will generate a DAX query for you telling you all about the columns such as counts, mins, and maxes. You can also go to an individual column and see the data in that column, and also do the column statistics query on an individual column. For measures in your model, you can define them all at once in a single query to see all the DAX expressions and how they evaluate. And on an individual me measure, you can go ahead and evaluate to see that value in a DAX query. You can hover to see the DAX expression or you can use inline to define that in the DAX query. You can edit the DAX query and then run that to see how that changes the output. And when you're happy with that, you can update the model with the new DAX expression for that measure. Finally, as measures tend to reference other measures in their DAX expression, you can define them all at once and then edit them and see them in the DAX editor. In the report view, the visuals themselves also have DAX queries. You can access them in the performance analyzer, and now you can simply run them in the DAX query view. Finally, if you already have a DAX query, you can format it with the click of a button in the DAX query view. You can also comment a line 
or uncomment a line just like you would with any query editor. So try it out today. Thank you. Thanks, Zoe. Next, we have Edit Your Data Model in Power BI Service Updates and Selection Expressions for Calculation Groups. Preview. For data connectivity, we have Azure Resource Graph, which is a new connector. Prophecy, we have a connector update. Bloomberg Enterprise Data and Analytics, a connector update. Dremio, a connector update. And Salonis, also a connector update. For service, we have Explore, which is in preview. And we're gonna hand it over to Roseanne for a demo. Within Power BI, there are many times users may need to perform an ad hoc exploration of their data. This could be an analyst who just got access to a new data source and wants to spend some time learning about the data before building a report off of it. Or maybe this could be a business user who needs an answer to a specific question to include in a PowerPoint presentation, but the report they're using doesn't quite have the answer they're looking for. Creating a new report from scratch in these cases is a large hurdle just to get a quick answer or a screenshot for a deck. I'd like to introduce you to the new Explore feature that just hit public preview, where users have a lightweight and focused experience to explore their data. Similar to exporting and building a pivot table in Excel, now directly within Power BI, users can quickly launch the new Explore experience to begin creating a matrix or visual to get the answers they need without all the distractions and extra complexity of building a report. Here, I have a Hawaii tourism semantic model that was just sent over my way, and I'd like to explore it. So, I open the options menu to find the new explore experience. Once here, I can start to explore this data. Over on the right side, you'll find the data pane that looks very familiar to our reporting experience. I'd like to check out which island in Hawaii has the most visitors. So I add visits and island to my matrix. After sorting some of visits, I can see that Oahu is actually the most popular island based on this data. And I can open the visual panel to see the visual representation of the same data. Now I'd like to see why there are a lot of visitors to Oahu. So I add trip purpose to my matrix. I only care about Oahu, so I can quickly add a filter using the add filter button up here at the top. I can also swap the visual type to be a column chart to see this a bit more easily. I can also swap how the view looks by using the split view to see it vertically, but I think I actually preferred it horizontal. Now that I know that Oahu is the most popular island for tourism and the most popular reason is for vacation, let me go ahead and add a filter for trip purpose as well. Now I want to check if the visits to Oahu for vacation follow any sort of seasonality trend. So I add date to my visual. Now I have a full hierarchy to take a look at, but I think I only care about what might change month to month instead of year to year. So I go ahead and drill just to look at month. I can also change the visual type again to be a line chart so this is easier to read. Ah, much better. Now I can see from the line chart that we have a lot more visitors coming to Oahu for vacation in the spring time frame, but it really starts to dip around the holidays. So this is something I want to send over to my colleague so first I'm going to save this exploration and then share it. You can see the saved exploration now in my workspace. Now I simply just have to open this back up and click share. And there you have it, the new Explorer experience in action, meant to be lightweight for all of your ad hoc needs. While this feature is in preview, we'd love to hear what you think. How useful are you finding it? What can make it more useful for you? Please let us know in our survey. Thanks, Roseanne. Next, we have one-lake integration for import mode semantic models, preview. 
RLS WAC OLS security and stored credentials for Direct Lake semantic models, preview, shareable cloud connections for semantic models, generally available, semantic model scale out, generally available, show visuals as table, preview, advanced filtering for paginated reports. Moving on to embedded analytics, we have dynamic dataset binding for paginated reports. For visualizations, we have the editor's pick of the quarter, and those are Performance Flow by XViz, Gala Geo for Power BI, Calendar by Data Now, Image Pro by CloudScope, and Sparkline by OKViz. New visuals and app source are Apex Gantt Chart. We've also got Zebra PI Tables 6.6, .6, introducing text columns. Funnel chart by PowerViz, and create interactive timelines with full control. For other, we have enhanced accessibility and paginated reports authored in Report Builder. Moving on to Synapse and starting with Data Warehouse, we have Query Insights, Data Warehouse publishing full DML to Delta Lake logs, automatic data compaction for Data Warehouse, Data Warehouse support for SP rename, improvements to CSV data ingestion, Fabric enables you to read multi-TB results from Warehouse. Blazing Fast Commute resource assignment is on. SSD metadata caching. Fabric SQL support for trim and generate series. Time travel through data, the magic of table clones. REST API support for Warehouse. SQL package support for Data Warehouse. User experience improvements and dynamic data masking for data warehouse and SQL analytics and endpoints. For data engineering, we have accessibility support for Lakehouse, enhanced multitasking experience in Lakehouse, upgraded data grid capabilities in Lakehouse, SQL reprovisioning support in Lakehouse, runtime 1.2, which includes Apache Spark 3.4, Java 11, and Delta Lake 2.4, multiple runtime support, Delta as the default table format in the new runtime 1.2, intelligent cache, monitoring hub for Spark enhancements, monitoring for Lakehouse operations, Spark application resource usage analysis, REST API support for Lakehouse artifact, load to tables and table maintenance, REST API support for Spark job definition, preview. Lakehouse support for Git integration and deployment pipelines. Embed a Power BI report in a notebook. MS Spark Utils new API. Reference run multiple notebooks in parallel. Notebook resource jar file support. Notebook Git integration, preview. Notebook and deployment pipeline, preview. Notebook REST APIs, preview environment preview and synapse vs code extension and vs code.dev also preview moving on to data science we have copilot and notebooks preview custom python operations in data wrangler data wrangler for spark data frames preview and we're going to hand it over to aaron for a quick demo if you've used Fabric Notebooks, you might be familiar with Data Wrangler, a tool that allows you to browse and apply common data cleaning operations and then generate the code that corresponds to them in real time. So far, Data Wrangler has supported Pandas data frames and generated Python code, but now it supports Spark data frames, so you can do the same operations and get PySpark in the end. In this example notebook, we're reading 50,000 sales records from a Lakehouse file into a Spark data frame. Then we can head up to that data tab and open the Data Wrangler prompt. It's the same as if we were opening a Pandas data frame, but we're going to notice that there's a list of PySpark data frames. There's also this option to customize the sample. So instead of taking the first subset of rows, we can take a random set of 10,000 rows and then open up that interface. When we do, we're going to see it looks very similar, basically identical to the interface for a Pandas Data Wrangler scenario. We have the display grid, on the left we have operations, on the right we have our summary. 
The main visible difference is this informational banner at the top of the grid, once everything loads, telling us that our Spark data frame has been converted down to a Panda sample for performance reasons, to keep everything snappy. But all the code generated in the end is going to be PySpark. Now we're going to take a look at the quick insights in the column headers and get started with a simple operation, dropping this order ID column. The workflow is the same as if we were dealing with the Pandas data frame. We're going to get a preview of the code, and then we can apply or discard it after looking at the display grid. Applying it logs that code to the left-hand side of the screen under cleaning steps. Next, we might want to go ahead and take a subset of columns that look like they should be numeric, but for some reason haven't been cast that way, and we can recast them manually. So we're going to select them and then go to the Operations panel and click Change Column Type. Instead of objects, we want them to be floats, so we're going to go ahead, put that in, get our code preview, and wait for the display grid to update to show us what that's going to look like. If we're happy with the result, we can go ahead and apply that step. Noticing that this recasting has also given us access to histograms in the column headers because we're dealing with numeric values now. We could keep going like this, applying steps in the same fashion, but for now we're going to add that code back to the notebook. And when we do, we notice that the tool reminds us that since we started with the Spark data frame, we're generating PySpark code at the end. You can preview the code. You can also check off a box to include the intermediate pandas code if you choose. But for now, we're going to head back into that notebook and take a look at our Spark function. All of those steps that we've applied have been wrapped up, and when we run the cell, we can get the result of them displayed right in our notebook. Voila. Thanks, Aaron. Next we have MLflow Notebook Widget, New Model and Experiment Item Usability Improvements, Recent Experiment Runs, Models Renamed to ML Models, Release of Synapse ML v1.0, Train Interpretable Explainable Boosting Machines with Synapse and ML, Pre-built AI models, reusing existing Spark session in Sparkler, REST API support for ML experiments and ML models, new data science happy path tutorial, expansion of data science samples, and new data science forecasting sample. Moving on to real-time analytics, we have Delta Parquet support in KQLDB, open source connectors for KQLDB, New and improved get data experience for real-time analytics. REST API support for KQL database. Event stream data transformation for KQL database. Splunk add-on preview. Get data from event stream anywhere in Fabric. Create a cloud connection within event stream. Two ingestion modes for Lakehouse des destination. Optimize tables before ingesting data to Lakehouse. Moving on to Data Factory and starting with Dataflow Gen 2, we have Fabric Connectors generally available, Automatic Refresh Cancellation, Error Message Propagation through Gateway, Support for Column Binding for SAP HANA Connector, Staging Artifacts will be hidden, New Power Query Editor Style, Support for VNet Gateways Preview, Cross Workspace Save As, Copy Activity now supports fault tolerance for Data Warehouse Connector. MongoDB and MongoDB Atlas connectors are now available. Microsoft 365 Connector now supports ingesting data into Lakehouse. Multitask support for editing pipelines in the designer from different workspaces. And last but not least, string interpolation added to pipeline return value. Well, that's all we have for you for this month. Let us know in the comments. What was your favorite feature? I'd love to hear about it. Also, let us know if you have any feedback on these videos, the community site, anything like that. By the way, check out, head, head right over to the community site. And as always, my name is Ryan Majitimer. Like, comment, subscribe. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.